from my perspective, the healthcare industry on the whole um, in 2023, 2024, it looks a lot like the tech sector 30 years ago. Hello, welcome to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar with Rehab U Practice Solutions. And if you run a healthcare business of any kind, you cannot effectively drive business to your business, can't drive customers in the door without understanding who you're speaking to, obviously, the target market you're you're hoping to address, and without answering the question, Where's the value? Now, that all starts with developing an effective value proposition or a positioning strategy, whatever you want to call it. But different stakeholders in healthcare determine what they consider valuable and the outcomes that they seek from either healthcare services, softwares, devices, based off of where they are in the value chain. I know I talk about this all the time. But you need to be able to answer the question of value to whom and specifically how you create and deliver the value for your targeted clients. Once you understand that, you have a clear idea of how your technology, your device, your software, or your healthcare service, your providers, are positioned to solve the most pertinent problems, the most valuable problems, faced by the specific stakeholders in healthcare that you're hoping to target and to sell to. If you want to learn more about how you can do that, about how we at Rehab U can help you do that, check out the Healthcare Positioning Alignment Workshop. What I tell people is give me 90 minutes and I will give you the foundation for a solid business development and marketing strategy for your healthcare company. Go to uh, positioning.rehabupracticesolutions.com to learn more about the Healthcare Positioning Alignment Workshop and get started driving real targeted leads, qualified leads to your healthcare business. Again, the URL for that is positioning.rehabupracticesolutions.com. Alrighty. This week, I'm excited to bring to you a conversation that I had with Paul Singh. He's the CEO of StratapT. And unlike uh, where you might think we're going to go, StratapT runs a an EMR slash RCM or revenue cycle management company uh, targeting physical therapy clinics, PTOT clinics in the musculoskeletal space. And instead of diving down the wormhole of what makes a good EMR and what makes uh, a good RCM platform, we talk about that kind of in broad base, but really what we, what we focus on in this conversation, he sums it up at the very end of our interview, uh, the three rules for winning the invisible game, as he calls it. I love having this conversation with Paul because he just dropped a lot of knowledge bombs <laughs> throughout, throughout the whole conversation. Um, so I'll just, I'll, la- I'll mention them here um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, setting him up before we dive into the conversation. But his three rules are, you never fight, a hell of, uh, you never fight an elephant head on. Number two, your brand isn't what you say it is. It's what people think about it or talk about it or believe about it, which is sidebar. We mentioned the positioning uh, alignment workshop. We can help you focus on how you craft that in the minds of your clients or prospective clients. And then number three, if you understand the hopes, dreams, and fears of the person across the table from you, then you can do whatever you want. And we talk about this a lot in healthcare, this idea of we need to get referrals, we need to drive leads, we need to do whatever. In the healthcare technology space where I'm in, doing a lot of work these days, a lot of it is we need to be able to drive uh, targeted or or qualified practice owners or, or healthcare clinics or healthcare buyers to the table. And really, if you follow these three rules, as Paul lays out, it really makes a lot of that much easier 
because you're getting down to the root of the problem. And I think he mentions it. I know that it is not something that is a super big secret, but while making a decision can be a very rational one, most humans, all humans really, are wired sort of to make decisions emotionally. So by targeting and understanding your audience deeply and really understanding what their hopes, their fears, their dreams are, you can speak to those true value drivers within any kind of business agreement or negotiations. The same is true in selling healthcare services or software or, or, or devices to healthcare organizations. Understanding those hidden value drivers really unlocks the door for a lot of real solid and long-term business relationships that are beneficial for both parties, right? We're not talking about selling snake oil here. If you have something truly valuable, then it is incumbent upon you, I would al almost argue like it is your responsibility to bring that uh, valuable thing, that solution to the marketplace for your targeted, uh, your, your prospective buyer, your ideal client. And by following these three rules, it can help you make those strategic decisions about how to best go about marketing and selling that product, that service, that device, that whatever. So um, without further ado, here's Paul Singh um, having a conversation and discussing a little bit the high level about technology and RCM, but really it's the it's the back door, the 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 back door discussion of really how you succeed in any business, healthcare not excluded, um, in a way that is again a win-win for everybody, where you are creating value. So um, Paul Singh, CEO of StratiPT, he's going to give you a little intro about himself and how he came into healthcare, being from the tech space, and then we'll dive right into the to the conversation of um, of succeeding succeeding in healthcare business. Well, hey Paul, welcome to the show. How are you? Good man, thanks for having me. I, uh, I I'm gonna be on my best behavior, uh, and I'm excited <laughs> to hang with you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is gonna be fun. I'm excited about diving into data and healthcare and all that. But before we we do that. Um, tell us a little bit about you and what you're doing now, because you're at Strata PT, um, and you were telling me before how you did not come from healthcare. So just kind of walk us through, like, why <laughs> yeah. are you in healthcare now? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to give you the two-minute overview. So sure. today, uh, I'm the uh, CEO of a company called Strata PT, and, and we uh, provide a unified EMR and RCM service um, for, for our clients. We'll talk about that if, if that's interesting. Um, but the sort of the, the, the two minutes of my background is um, I'm not from healthcare. Uh, I've never been a PT. I never, I, I'm an engineer by training, computer engineering, electrical engineering, and um, soft, uh, computer science. And I um, spent the last 20 some years um, starting businesses, growing them, uh, and then investing in thousands of others as well. So, um, some of the more notable stuff, I, I started a, a, a data center company about 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. Uh, we still operate that business. Uh, I make it sound big like we, it's just my wife and I, but you know, we've got <laughs> hey, multiple, we. multiple large data company. centers in Virginia. Yeah. Uh, so that, and that's part of that's that's what kicked off this. And then um, over the years, I started a venture capital firm, uh, co-founded something called 500 Startups, or now 500 Global. Um, uh, we manage about $4 billion of capital through that uh, entity now. Um, uh, Co-founded another company called Bump Health uh, in the women's health space, um, doing pretty well, still running, you know, that's still running as well. And all through that, I've sort of um, been investing in other businesses on the side. So my wife and I try to invest in about 200 new companies a year. Um, and about half of those are tech you know, like traditional software, tech, that sort of stuff. And the other half is um, what we, you know, brick and mortar. So um, bars, restaurants, uh, code schools, daycares, taco trucks, you name it, you know. And and so that could be a different episode entirely. But yeah. I share all that only because healthcare, I'm pretty new to healthcare. I um, stepped into this role. So, so Strata PT was actually founded by somebody I went to high school with. Oh, um, okay. uh, and so Kim... Uh, Peacock is is still with the company. She's our COO, um, uh, but she started it, and I stepped in as our CEO a little over a year ago. Um, and so I'm 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 new, and <laughs> um, and I, I hope I don't offend people just a few minutes into the show. But <laughs> you know, the, one of the reasons I um, one of the things I think a lot about is is that 
the healthcare industry. Uh, so let me speak in broad terms. Please don't get offended, listeners. Yeah. You know, but from my perspective, the healthcare industry on the whole um, in 2023, 2024, it looks a lot like the tech sector 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and I'll just give you one example as an analogy, and then I'll stop talking. Um, so, so uh, the New York Stock Exchange, that's got to be something that your listeners are familiar with. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I think the average listener will also know that right now in 2024, they can go to something like eTrade.com or CarlSchwab.com. They can go to any online place and they can literally go and buy one share of something. They could buy one share of IBM, one share of whatever. It's like a non-issue. Nobody ever thinks about it because it's normalized now. People don't remember though that, you know, when I was young, uh, I won't age you, but I'll age myself. But when I was young, people don't remember that like up until the late eighties, uh, the New York Stock Exchange was closed on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. No surprise there, but also it was closed on Wednesdays. And that's because way back when the, well, the, the financial industry was not computer enabled, when it was gate kept by a few very rich people, very rich firms, you know, that sort of thing, everything was done on paper and everything was gate kept. Uh, it's not that technology didn't exist. It's just that some of the incumbents didn't want it. Yeah. And so because of that, it had to shut down on Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays to process all the paper. And, um, the point is, though, is that once technology was introduced, everything changed. And this, the really what it did was destroyed all the middlemen, all the people that yeah. kept it. And I don't think healthcare is going to take 30 years to get there. Uh, I think we're probably somewhere in the five to seven year range um, because tech moves faster and faster. So let me pause there. Yeah. My superpower is to ramble. <laughs> no, that's that is awesome. That's extremely interesting. We might have you on again just to talk about the investment side and what you're doing there. But um, okay, so I guess then what's the what maybe what's the connection to healthcare? You knew this person from high school, and it was just like step into the CEO role, and now you run a strata, <laughs> or I'm assuming you invested uh, in it, and, that, and that's why you're uh, here. I will admit. Let me just admit openly, uh, and again, hopefully. I won't lose any of your listeners along the way. <laughs> I will admit openly that I'm I'm a capitalist, and yeah. um, you know, and so when I like I didn't know about RCM and all this stuff. To, so let me take a minute to explain this. So I um, I've got four kids, and yeah. uh, for right. anybody for for anybody with kids, what you uh, at least oh, I'll just speak for myself. My experience as being a father is that the first time we got pregnant. I was just like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, like everything's crazy. I, I didn't, you know, I just wanted to make sure everybody was good. I didn't really, I, I went to all the appointments, but I didn't really know what was happening, right? Um, but when I, when we got pregnant with the second one, I was a lot more confident and I felt like I was able to experience more. And I started to notice these, like, I just noticed how much my wife was getting marketed to. And yeah. what really triggered me uh, was back in 2018, I think, when when we were pregnant with number two, um, my wife was getting hit up with all these postcards from a company called Aeroflow. And uh, the long and short of it is that Aeroflow basically is one of many companies that- They bought a list um, from somebody and your wife was on it. <laughs> yeah, they know she's pregnant. And basically what they do is they target pregnant or expecting moms and they say, hey, give us a copy of your you know, um, insurance card and we'll mail you a free breast pump. Well, I'm a capitalist and I'm like, nothing is free. So exactly. what in the world is How this? How are they doing it? Yeah. You know, and so I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll I'll fast forward here a little bit, but over the year, you know, I, I, I was, I told you I'd um, uh, co-founded this, this uh, company in the women's health space. Well, we, at the time it was, it was only doing subscription boxes for pregnant moms. And I was, <laughs> I was selling subscription mo boxes to pregnant moms. We were, you know, uh, millions of customers, all that. And, and so uh, all of a sudden I'm like, well, wait a second, how does this work? And I literally started cold calling these companies like Aeroflow and just ask, like, I just acted like a dumb customer. And I'm like, what, how do you do this? Why do you want my wife's info? <laughs> and then finally somebody said, all right, well, it's really called RCM and DME and all that. And I started Googling this and I'm like, what in the yeah. world is this world? And so as we kind of kept growing that, we started giving away, doing the free breast pump thing. I started learning more about DME, but that around that same time, I was, you know, sort of reconnected with Kim, like, you know, and, and, and I was like, is this what you do? 
<laughs> and she's like, well, not really, you know, but then as I get, so anyway, after about two or three years of, you know, figuring it out on the women's health side. So that company, Bump Health is still doing well, you know, crushing. Uh, but one thing led to another and I was kind of like, wait a second, there's a lot more opportunity here to become sort of the payments layer yeah. of, uh, of healthcare. And so um, I spent about a year kind of getting to know him and the company a lot more closely, um, you know, and, and then finally decided to step in as the CEO. But that's kind of the quickish version yeah. of how I got into it. It's just that I'm a capitalist. And I think that the amount of money that flows through the RCM layer of healthcare, you know, think even if you just start thinking broader than just PT, OT, speech, whatever. Yeah. Hundreds it's of millions of dollars. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, it's double digits of the U S GDP. Yeah. We're not talking like, you know, chump change here. It's, it's arguably bigger than e-commerce and all these other tech sector things that I thought were big, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so yeah. Um, so hopefully the listeners don't think any less of me, but you know, I, I, I stumbled into RCM because they were targeting my mom, my wife. <laughs> yeah. And then I started to learn more and, and, um, so yeah, I, I just, I think there's a big opportunity here and I think, um, well, actually let me pause there. Cause I can yeah, go no, a lot of different directions. I, think, I mean, this. I think that's great. I think especially on the clinical side, I, I'm not going to say this is a problem with healthcare, but I have said it a lot to clients behind closed doors. I'm just making it public now. Clinicians as a whole, and maybe, maybe there's other industries where it's kind of like this, but clinicians just feel icky about making money, right? Because it's like, there's this, it's a vocation, it's a calling, we're serving people. But I mean, I think that at the, at the end of the day, you got to make money to make things. To make, Look, I, make I'm a, uh, right I hope I don't sound too cynical here, but I think, so what that's called is an invisible script. Uh -huh. So when, when people like, you know, it's that voice inside of our heads, like I should do this, I don't do this, yeah. here's why I do this. So that invisible script is mostly formulated by your parents as you grow up. Uh -huh. But as you become an adult, it's actually then formulated by lobbyists and PR firms. And so where I'm going with this is, is that, you know, I do believe that a lot of practice owners and, and medical professionals get into the career because they internally want to help people. I do believe that. But then as they get into the career and start to practice and get experiences, it's, it's almost like somewhere in there, they're taught that making money is a bad thing, yeah. that it's supposed to be this hard. But what I like to remind people is, is that if, if I run a, a Starbucks or let, let's just, let's just say, let's just take them out for a minute. Let's just say I own a, um, what's the word? Let, let's just say I own a, uh, a coffee shop. Well, if you walk into my coffee shop, well, there's a couple things that we need to kind of recognize here. You walk into the coffee shop and you ask me for a cup of coffee. If you don't pay me, I'm not giving you a cup yeah, of coffee. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And if you do pay me, let's just say you do use a credit card. Well, you're going to swipe it right there. Right. And I'm going to get that approval or denial instantly. So I'm really not letting you out of there without a coffee cup. Right. Or uh, without a payment, yeah, yeah. you know, and on top of that, the deposit for that shows up in my bank account two days later. Yeah. Now contrast that to when I started my first business 20 some years ago, a credit card payment was the worst because it could take me six weeks to see that money. Right. Yeah. And you but, didn't but own anyway, that money right away. Like they could put a hold on it and say, we're not giving exactly. it to you. Like, you had to yeah. have collateral up. Yeah. It was crazy. But today, like I can, you and I could walk down to, to, to the local, um, what's the word, the local best buy you and I right now, like we, we could buy a square credit card reader. I mean, it is that easy to accept money and, and, and start a hot dog stand. Right. But now let's, let's go back to this, this, this start, this, uh, you know, coffee shop example, cause this is really where it, it, it grinds my gears. All right. So now you can't walk away without, uh, with a cup of coffee without paying me. We all agree with that. Okay. Now I've got a bunch of baristas working there making the coffee. Well, if I don't pay them, like for better or for worse, as a business owner, there's not much that can like send you to jail except payroll. Yeah. So here's the thing. If I'm even a penny off on my, on my payroll for my employees, 
the the state employment commission is coming after me and for any of the lawyers listening there's a term called piercing the veil man you know what that means like you're not protected by the llc at that point because that you know it can get pretty crazy but so i guess what i'm just trying to say is in this example of a coffee shop or put any example you want in your head in every other industry if you do not pay your employees on time fairly whatever you get in a lot of trouble and hey, let's extend it to contractors. You don't pay your vendors, pay your contractors. Well, not only will they stop serving you, but they can also take you to court, yeah. right? I mean, try not try to skip paying your plumber, by the way. They can put a lien on your house in this country, right? Yeah. Okay, now that we've said all that, what I'm trying to make a point of is, is that in every other industry in the United States of America, there are protections in place for the person doing the work, the person paying for the work. I mean, it is very, very but there's like this exception for healthcare. Somehow it's okay if I say to you, hey, listen, um, uh, listen, I'm the healthcare insurance company or whatever, hey, listen, uh, Rafi, I really don't like that you used red ink today, so yeah. I'm gonna kick that back to you. Oh, hey, listen, I don't know how, I don't care how busy you are, Rafi, but uh, timely filing, you missed the window, sorry, man. Like, <laughs> this is insane, this yeah. is absolutely insane, but yet, if I put five PTs in a room, they've convinced each other and themselves that this is normal. Yeah. Right. It's and it all comes back to this invisible script. I think we've all, um, you know, you, you, you know, you as a medical professional probably know the exact term for this, but like, it's kind of like if you have like a nagging injury, if, if I had a nagging injury and you saw me walking for the first time, you'd probably notice it right away. Cause you're like, Paul, what in the world is wrong with your leg? Yeah. But if I've been living with it, I'm like, oh, that's just normal. And yeah. I think that's conceptually what's happened in the PT world right now is that everybody thinks it's okay. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, well, what do you, I mean, like even with this change healthcare, uh, yeah, you know, you can only access TRICARE through change. What? Are you kidding me? Like, the, like this is not a, this, I was actually talking about this with somebody on our podcast uh, earlier this week. I'm like, these are not technical limitations by the, by the, by the um, clearing houses. These are business limitations. These are basically monopolies that are, that are running and, and, and it's not technology that limits it. So anyway, I told, I warned you, I can, yeah, I can no, ramble about this stuff, but I get fired up about it. <laughs> so. Yeah, no. And I think that's, I mean, that leads right into what, what Strad does like this whole idea of RCM and why is this even a thing in the first place? But it is true, like even in and the the change thing kind of brings this to light too. like healthcare is such a cash flow dependent business. We take it for granted that we can walk into um, a doctor and get seen. We can go get, you know, go see PT, your, you know, your insurance is going to take care of it. I'm just going to cover my copay or whatever. But there's all of this on the back end that's working authorizations and you know, claims are being filed and it's running through a clearinghouse and the, you got to make sure it's attached to the ledge or like all of that kind of stuff is happening in the back end. And all it takes is a disruption to like really put a chink chink in it. Like you mentioned the whole, like going into a coffee shop and paying. I haven't had health insurance for seven years. And I tell people all the time, like I would never go back, but we we're basically <laughs> cash pay. Um, yep. So we walk into any kind of healthcare clinic organization, whatever, um, we say we're cash patients. What's the price? We pay it. We walk away. Easiest transaction in the world, or at least it should be. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually expecting you're on number four. We're on kid number kid number six. Will be here in two weeks. Uh, yes, for us. So we walked into a hospital locally, and this hospital just got it just acquired the small local hospital. So now it's like a big national corporate or whatever. Um, my wife, you know, they're doing the pre-registry. You got to go in, you got to pay whatever up front, yada, yada, yada. You would have thought that we were asking them to like move mountains. We were like, well, we don't have insurance. And they were like, what do you mean? We don't have insurance. So it's like, well, usually what happens is you tell me how much it's going to cost. I swipe the credit card. We go, go <laughs> our ways. Now we're like emailing corporate, some corporate guys like emailing me saying, we should have an estimate to you within two to three business days. I'm like, this should be the easiest thing in the world. But it goes back to like, healthcare isn't set up for it. It's not set up for like this simple, I provide you this service, you, you pay me for this service and we can go our own ways. We built this entire mechanism 
of third party payers and the back end and it where it now takes what 45 days to completely collect for a PT visit it's nuts it just doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense to me so let's dive into this RCM world for most people will understand RCM on the level on like a high level oh revenue cycle management but what does that really mean for like a private practice clinician when they're saying revenue cycle management I know it's important what what is it and why do they need it why do they really need to be concerned about it <laughs> um, the, the way I sort of explain this to my, you know, non medical friends, just, just to kind of like, you know, use that, uh, set that up is I usually just say, like, think of RCM as the broad set of things that have to happen in order for the practice to get paid by the health insurance company or, or whoever's paying, right? Like a health insurance company, whoever it is. So it's, it's this broad set of things that have to happen in order for the doctor to see even a penny of money that they earned during that, uh, that visit uh, with the patient. Um, so, and it starts from the day that patient walks in there for the visit, you know, uh, or I guess technically it starts the day they, finish the notes from the visit, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, and it starts from that day. And then in a perfect world, it should finish up with a payment in their bank account, you know, in, in, depending on the payer up to 45 days later, like, you know, Medicare, for example, would pay within 15 days, but that, that's a great one. But then you got some payers that are 45 days. Now that's the perfect scenario, by the way. Then in reality, what really happens is that you know, whoever was doing your billing, you know, maybe they were on the phone at the same time. There was just a small error, just the tiniest little thing. And all of a sudden that claim gets kicked back, but it doesn't get kicked back. So they, or it doesn't get kicked back right away. So if you can imagine this thing on a flow chart, you, you know, the, the, the PT or the PTA or whatever closes out the notes, whether they, now there's a billing thing that starts. Now, whether they have a billing person in house or they outsource it to some firm in Idaho or India or wherever, there's a human being that gets involved and then um, they submit it. And as long as they submit it and everything's good, then the payment comes, but reality hits. And that is yeah. somewhere the human made a mistake. And now three days later, they're processing the claims for that day, but now, that other claim from three days ago just came back. Hey, there's something wrong. And to make matters worse, they don't usually tell you what's wrong. Yeah. The they claim. just deny you it. Figure right? it out. They give you some kind yeah. of code. It's like eight five. Well, what does eight five mean? <laughs> Gotta Bingo. go look at the manual. <laughs> See, that's it right there. And so um ultimately that's what happens is that there's this rub. And so when we think about like why um uh um you know so, so like like a lot of the latest, so I'm trying not to date this, this uh, episode too much, but I don't know how to do it. So let's just say it this way, you know, we're recording this in the, uh, like in March of 2024 and anybody listening to this knows that every January, for example, all the deductibles reset, right? Yeah. Well, like when that happens, um, it really exposes a lot of the mess of private uh, of practices because it now you know you're not going to get paid until like the you know the the patient pays their their part of the deductible right and so now it exposes whether or not the practice is actually good at collecting money from the patient <laughs> you know it, yeah exactly the, the 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 point is though is it's just this RCM is this big set of practices that have to happen to get the practice paid and um, it's complicated it's messy um, and it's got a it's got way more literal hands in it than there should be. Uh, so let me pause there because I can keep going about this. Too. Yeah, <laughs> no, and I, I think that's a good, that's a good baseline. So there's, there's this thing that's, you got to do all this stuff to get paid. And like you said, there's a lot of different hands in there, whether it be a billing company, or oftentimes you've got a billing company, billing person, and you've got like a, a billing software that you're paying to do it. And then you've got maybe some kind of auditor or financial person that's managing it. And like it, you've got a lot of hands in the cookie jar. So by that, by the time the, the, maybe the, the provider receives payment for that visit, they've already spent what 80 cents on that, on that dollar that they made or whatever. They spent a good bit of it paying all these intermediaries. And this is where a group like strata comes in. You're kind of removing some of that and one making it more streamlined, but then let's, let's talk about some of the transparency because one of the things, and I was telling you this before the show, one of the things that I really like about 
the way y'all have chosen to kind of, we'll just say market because that's what it is. You're marketing this product is it's very like open, transparent. Like a lot of your data is available on the website. I send people to the, the strata, the benchmarking for like, let's see where you're at revenue per visit wise versus all of your peers in your ge geographic location. Like all of that is, is there. So talk a little bit about that. Like one, one, why you chose to make that data readily available. And then obviously it's, you see some value in doing that and what it's done for, for strata and the business kind of as you've grown it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I will just kind of start by saying that, um, you know, when I stepped into the role a year or more ago, whatever it was, um, one of the things I was very clear about with the team is that transparency would be the name of the game. Now, let me also say, it's not that the team was not transparent before that, but this industry as a whole, when I come into it from an outsider standpoint, it is not transparent. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there, there's just a lot of like gatekeeping, you know, I remember when I was due diligence in even this company, I called a whole bunch of PTs that I had met over the years, you know, people that friends of friends and, 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 you know, took them out to dinner. And it was really fascinating listening to these practice owners after they've got two glasses of wine in them and you're like, Hey, so what, talk, like, tell me about the business. What's horrible, whatever. And I still remember like vividly, one of the guys I was talking to just looked at me and said, Paul, I have no idea. I remember we were like driving down this street actually. And I said like, you know, I got him, you know, we were talking, talking, and he just looked at me deadpan at a red light and we were looking around. I was like, man, there's a lot of PTs. Like, there, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, therapy places on this corner. What is this? And he's like, and he just looked at me deadpan. He goes, Paul, you know, that's not even the interesting part. The interesting part is, is none of these PTs, even though they might accept all the same insurance, none of these PTs probably know what the other is making. Yeah. And I was like, what, how does that work? Cause I can like, we're driving down the street and I can pick between a shell and an Exxon and I know which one <laughs> is one cent cheaper on the gas. He's like, and that's how, what, like all of a sudden I'm like, what in the world? So anyway, with that being said, you know, um, I'm running the same playbook here that I've run at all my other businesses over the years, which is, you know, any, I told you I'm a capitalist, right? And yeah. so here's the thing. Um, a lot of people want to think that their industry is different. Every industry wants to say, we're so different, you know? Yeah. And uh, at the, if I haven't already like, you know, uh, uh, frustrated your listeners or whatever, I'll just say that I believe that every industry, 80% of every industry is the same. And in the, in this context, when we talk about marketing and, and, and transparency and all that, any industry that operates uh, through, um, obscurity or opaqueness or whatever, you can't, why would you fight that head on? Like, I, like what you should do is actually just put a flashlight on it, you yeah. know? So in other words, transparency is the way to go when everybody else is gatekeeping the information. Yeah. Right. Like that's just how that, that's how you fight it. It's, it's not about being like, I, I'd like you to believe I'm a nice guy. I think I'm a nice guy, but let's be very clear here. Like we're, we're going down the transparency path because every time I run into an industry where there's like opaqueness or gatekeeping or whatever. The only way to, to win uh, quickly in those industries is to just put the data out there and let people see for themselves what has been hidden from them all this time. You know, yeah. and, and I think I said to you in the pre-show before we hit the record buttons, uh, this in, in the pre-show, and I'll say it again, you know, for, for your listeners, I genuinely don't care if somebody uses Strata or not. And I mean that in a positive way. What I mean is, is like, I'm sharing everything we know, uh, online, offline, everything. I'm sharing it all because I just want you to get paid. Now, I hope you do it with us, but hey, if you, if you, can, get, if you can get somebody else to do it, great, but just get paid for every penny you're owed because that's not okay. Like, it's not okay that this happens in this industry. Um, so anyway, transparency is, kind of like the way we should all be, you know, we should demand that of everybody. And, and um, I just, you know, I remember when we first, so it took me about, uh, I think it took us about maybe 60 days of coding to kind of like get that all figured out and, and, and get it all exposed uh, once I started doing all that stuff. And I sent the link right back to that same guy. 
<laughs> and and I was like, hey man, I don't know if this is gonna help you, but uh, here's the first version of it. And uh, you know, he was like, holy cow, this replaces this annual or this monthly dinner I do. And I was like, what? Yeah. He's like, yeah. And so then this took me to the next thing. I'm. I hope I don't get your podcast in trouble. You might have to bleep this part out. <laughs> um, he said. Um, he was like, yeah, Paul, this is great. This saves me that like monthly dinner that I have to do. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, like the local, um, uh, ther uh I think it's the local APTA organization. Whatever, he's like, yeah. he's like, yeah, we're not allowed to talk about rates, um, you know, on the email list. So there's a dinner that all the guys put together once a month and I got to go down there and, and then we just talk about it over dinner and, and figure out who's getting paid paid what? And he's like, yeah, now I can spend one more night uh, a month with my family. And I'm yeah. like, wait, what? Yeah. Well, because people want to know it, right? And they're going to sit around, they're going to figure out how it is. Yeah. See, and, and see, that's, yeah, that's the thing. It, it, that, that's the thing that people that gatekeep information don't realize is that eventually people will find out. It, it's kind of like when people have like opaque salaries, you know, like, Hey, please don't talk about salaries. Like, what do you think people would do outside of work? Yeah, <laughs> they we're will texting talk about right it. there in the office. They're like, how much do you make? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it happens, right? So um, anyway, yeah, so we're just running this playbook where we try to give away all the data we can. And we genuinely, genuinely, genuinely want people to get paid, whether or not they are one of our customers, which is why you'll notice none of our calculators, none of our data is behind a paywall or a registration. I was about wall, to say, or even a pop-up or anything like that. Yeah. Sometimes you yep. get folks that are like, it's all free, but you got to give us your email address or something like that. It's, it's, it's refreshing yeah. yep. to say, to say the least. But, um, so, I mean, I guess without getting too much into it, cause you don't have to share whatever you don't want to share. It's, you seem pretty open though. Like <laughs> you're all of these benchmarks that you, that Strata has like on their, um, I think it's called like the real time payer benchmark or whatever. And you can like, you can even go down to each state, like compare yourself to where you are state wise. And we'll yeah. link to that in the show notes. We can go look at that if you run a practice. Are you basing that off of your current clients, uh, current clients performance? Or are you like looking at other data to do that? Like what's, what's the driving force behind some of that? I'd imagine it's all the claims that you're processing for folks, right? It's the actual claim data. And actually, if you dig even deeper into those calculate or into the public data set, you'll even see the CPT code combinations oh, okay. that get you to those numbers. Yeah, so yeah. this is real data. Um, now, this is where like the tech nerds are going to crucify me here a little bit. It says real time. It's technically delayed, I think, up to five minutes, but it's yeah. still near real time. It's, yeah. it's, you know, but, but if I anybody mean, five like, minutes hey, in healthcare is, you know, that's, that's pretty yeah, I mean, much we, real time. We're, we're not talking 45 coming, days. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we've got enough data coming in, like somebody listening to this, if they like reloaded it, you know, 30 times in one minute, they'd be like, Hey, you said it was real time. How come it's not working? It's because like it, the data actually refreshes from our back end every five minutes or so, or something like that. Um, I don't know what I built there, but anyway, the point is though, is that, yeah, it's real data, uh, of the claims as they come back through our platform. Um, one thing I should mention, because I think it's, this is not meant to be an advertisement, but it's, it's okay. So, so let me, let me, let me say it to you this way. Um, I'm a big believer in foundational questions that, you know, can be universally applied. And one of those foundational questions that I think people should ask, and, and when I say universally, I mean, you should ask this question I'm about to tell you when you're dating somebody new, when you're thinking about getting married, when you're going to do a new business deal, when you're going to pick a new CPA, the one question I think everybody should ask of a new partner is this, what is something you believe that everybody else in your industry or your profession will disagree with? And yeah. when you think about that question, now I'll bring it to my answer uh, as it relates to Strata and the RCM world as a whole. I do not believe you can uh, mix and match the technology stack at a practice. We at Strata do not believe that you should have to pay for software. You, so what that means is, is we actually just give away the EMR. We give away the software, the scheduling. You, know, you don't have to bolt all these. This is crazy that in yeah. 2024, people pay all these fees or whatever, right? It's like an add-on so, for this, an add-on for that, or you're 
piecemealing right. it with, you know, this server and that, you know, that vendor right. or whatever. Right. Now, uh, and, and I'll just, as I say this, I hope people will kind of like take this in, you know, like understand the context here. The numbers we post on the website are real. You'll even see our own revenue numbers, like how much money goes through the platform on any given time period. You can literally see it all right there. One, the one thing I want people to understand is, is we're our, the entire size of our team, we're like 35 people. We're all in the US, but it's only 35 people. And the thing is, is how do you do that? Well, it's all technology. We, yeah. I mean, obviously great people. I gotta say that, right? Great people, great people. But technology, like how do you, how do you fight the payers? It's not gonna be, you can't fight multi-billion dollar payers with a, you know, unless you have an army of a thousand you know, billers, but even then you're not gonna win. It's technology you gotta use because like, Code doesn't sleep. Code doesn't need a day off. Code doesn't care if the payer made them wait on hold for 30 minutes. Seven hours, yeah. <laughs> right? So the code's going to do its thing. So um, so uh, anyway, like um, the thing that we, so now like let's get really deep into this. Yeah. When I talk about this question of like what we believe that everybody else would disagree on is that we don't think you should have to pay for software. We don't think you should have to mix and match software. And, and, it's not even that you shouldn't have to uh, mix and match software. It's that you should not mix and match software. So um, the easiest way for me to explain this now, because this is really, really important. This is one of the foundational things that I think people need to understand for their own practices. The RCM cycle, we can all agree, is super important. Because if, if at any point it gets screwed up, you're not going to get paid. Regardless yeah. of whether you use us or not, if your biller screws it up, if your vendor screws it up, you're not going to get paid. But here's the thing. Your scheduling system needs to know how many visits might be left uh, in that yeah. patient's you know, uh, plan. Um, your EMR should kind of know if RTM is an option for this person, right? Like, well, here's the thing. Most EMR companies out there right now are bolt-ons right? Like they have API connections to so-and-so biller, da, da 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 But on top of that, they started as an EMR first, right? So yeah. here's the thing. They're just housing any... clinical records. That was their whole right. job. Right. And, and that is important. Don't get me wrong. But here's the thing. If you don't understand the foundation of billing, the foundation of RCM, then how do you know if the way you've structured your medical records is actually relevant to getting paid. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, like I, I can talk all day about, or, you know, like a lot of EMRs will talk about their features. They'll be like, Oh, we've got AI this or AI that and like, Oh, okay. You don't understand billing. Cause uh, who's at fault if that, that AI wrote the wrong thing in the note, are you, you know, like whenever people are like, oh, we made this new AI note taking me, I'm like, okay, you've never gotten paid before or never had to yeah. worry about getting paid. Never before. submitted it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so the point is though, is that like, if you think about us, we, if you look at our history, we're like 14 years old and actually, and I say this with all the respect in the world, we started as a billing company. We started out in many ways, just like a lot of the other billing companies out there, you know, spreadsheets, duct taped with uh, emails and uh, attention to detail. Like that's our history. And then over the years, we tried to integrate with all the EMRs, you know, and we did all that. And you know what happened is that like when somebody didn't get paid, they didn't call the EMR, they called us. Yeah. And we're like, well, hang, hang on. You shouldn't have, ex you shouldn't have like treated that patient. Yeah. And they're like, well, how was I supposed to know? I'm like, well, your EMR didn't tell you that, you know? Yeah. And so eventually um, we actually killed off all APIs. We don't integrate actually with any other EMR now because the integration doesn't matter unless the EMR actually surfaces the billing data, you know, like don't schedule the appointment unless you know you're going to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so anyway, um, that's why we give away the software. We actually ended up having to build our own EMR uh, to make this happen. It's not fun. Uh, I mean that with all respect, yeah. it's not fun, but it's the only way to make it work. Like you had to like, we had to like verticalize the software stack, you know? And so um, anyway, that's, that's the thing. And I, I, I think that like, we just don't think you should have to pay for this software. Yeah. And we also don't think we should get paid unless you get paid, you know? I think um, 
you know, uh, one of my, if you like Google me and like scroll back on my Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, one of the things I've said for 20 years, just like nonstop is like, I really do think that the, one of the most important things that the internet brought to the world is that, um, access to information, right? Like yeah. I, I remember, I remember growing up, like, unless you had a rich kid living down the street that had access to the encyclopedia Britannica, you didn't know anything back in the eighties, right? <laughs> like yeah. there was no way to learn. Um, but now you can Google it. And so from our perspective, you know, when I think about um, giving away information, I believe that information should be free. You got to pay for the work though. Right. So like, even with this people, if anybody like isn't totally turned off by me now, they're probably, uh, if they've made it this far, here's the thing. Most people look at what we do in terms of giving away this information. They're like, oh my gosh, Paul, if you give away the information, what happens? These people will never pay you or whatever. It's like, okay, hold on, buddy. Here's the thing. If you give away information and somebody goes on and does something cool with it, great. They were going to do it anyway. Exactly. They were going to do it anyway. Nothing you were going to say was going to change their mind. Even if they became a customer of yours, uh, um, you know, behind the gatekeeping and all that, they're going to find out enough anyway that they're going to go do it. Like, that's just like, let's not kid ourselves here. Like hiding it, hiding information does not make the problem go away. It just slows it down. And so from our perspective, the way I think about it is give it away, give it away, give it away. Worst case scenario with that, you get value. Other people get value, even if they never talk to me or use our service. But, you know, the best case scenario is the, the few percent that are like, hey, I believe what you believe, Paul, they come. They, they, they let yeah. us, you know, they let us do it for them. Um, so anyway, I, yeah, give away more information. Like even for the PTs listening, like, I don't know, if you're on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, like, that's a big Talk one. Talk about what you do. Like yeah. give away the advice. Like even like, this is why I love your content strategy. You know, it's like the, I was just talking about you and your practice to somebody else today, uh, yesterday. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's got somebody that works there that actually is training for a marathon. I was like one of the most memorable things you said yeah. when, when you came on our show. And I'm like, this is amazing because like, like I'm training for marathons and I can, I can watch that content and get something out of it. And look, 99% of the people that watch that content probably are not within driving distance of your practice. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But that's not the point. The point is like, like you're giving it away and nobody else is. And, yeah. and the thing is like, like, it, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's about so crafting smart. the, it, it's about crafting this, like not an aura, but you're positioning yourself as an, as an expert and experts. Someone, someone said this to me one time that I thought was, was really good. Like, you spread your, you should think about spreading your expertise kind of like a crop duster, like far and wide. Half of those, you're like, obviously not, you just said it. 99% of the people that read it aren't going to, aren't going to be in a position to pay you. They're not going to be for whatever reason. They're not geographically close to you. They're not going to whatever. Um, the, you get paid when you have to land that crop duster and consult with the farmer about what he needs on his field. Right. So, you know, I think that's just the just the way to do it. Like you spread that information. It's out there anyways, or people could find it. Like you said, they're gonna they're gonna become customers of yours to find out what you're doing and then go do it somewhere else, you know? Like yeah, it's, absolutely. They, it, like, where there's a will, gonna, there's a way. Exactly. They're, they're gonna they're gonna do it with or without you anyway. So so you might as well give it away. And and I think, okay, so this is you might edit this out or might want to edit this out if it doesn't make sense, but for whatever it's worth, you know, like so let's just assume for a minute that some of the listeners here are entrepreneurs of some sort, whether yeah. they're entrepreneurial in their own careers or they're you know they own their own practice, whatever like they're let's just say they're they're entrepreneurial for the next like sixty seconds, I'm going to speak to them. Here's the thing. I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I really am not. I, you know i'm I feel like I'm a dog chasing a car. <laughs> you know that's how I spent the last forty three years of my life. but um but here's the thing. What I'm about to tell you, um, I have no scientific proof for, I, I don't know how to like prove this to anybody, but I can tell you that all of my success in my career financially and otherwise has come from three rules that I, I, I don't like, I, again, I have no scientific backing in this, but this is how, what I believe. And you'll see in a minute that it applies to everything that we're talking about here. Um, okay. So there's a game people play 
uh, and that game of life is what they taught you in school, what your parents baked into you, like work hard, uh, just, you know, do what you say, like all those things that we all learned, right? That's called the, that's the game people play, right? Um, and then there's the invisible game of how the world actually works. Now, if for anybody it's like already cynical, they can turn the pot off and, and walk away and whatever. But here's the thing. If, if it was true that everybody's playing the same game, then there would not be some people driving a $10,000, you know, Corolla and other people driving a $500,000 Ferrari, right? In, in other words, if, there, if we were all playing the same game, then everything should be normalized. So the fact that there are disparities across industries and roles and ages and stuff like that suggests that there's an invisible game. That invisible game, you know, why some people get ahead and others don't, you know, whether it's financially, freedom-wise, whatever it is, really comes down, in my opinion, to three rules. The three rules of the invisible game are this. Number one, you never fight an elephant head on. Number two, your brand is not what you said it is. It's how other people perceive you or talk about you. And number three, if you understand the hopes, fears, and dreams of the person or the people across the street, uh, the, the, the table from you, you can do anything you want. And so like in the context of, uh, you know, this industry, for example, the elephant, well, the elephant in the context of RCM is healthcare payers. Well, you're not going to fight a healthcare payer head on. So you either need to go cash pay a hundred percent. You can do that. Or if you're going to accept some sort of insurance, you need to either have an army of hardworking people that are going to like pay attention to details, or you need to embrace technology and code and, and build an army of robots that never sleeps and, yeah. and can whittle them down. Right. Um, and then even in terms of brand, like, you know, um, uh, you know, like uh, when we give away information and stuff like that, like it, it, what I say about strata is irrelevant. What people believe about it or read about it is real. Like what they, what they do. And so if I just give away all the information, I let people make the decision they want about what they believe we are. It doesn't matter what I say. I can tell you this is the best thing since sliced bread. It doesn't matter. But if I just give you all the information, let you decide, yeah. make then the you decide yourself. what you bring. Yeah. Right. And then the last thing is, you know, understanding the other person's hopes, fears, and dreams. Like, you know, a lot of our, let's just use strata as an example, then people can extrapolate to their own practices and careers. A lot of people that sell stuff to practice owners focus on feature. Hey, by the way, we do this, this, and this, and this. Rafi, listen, we can do this, this, and this, right? Meanwhile, you're sitting there on the other end of this and you're like, buddy, I just want to get paid. And, you know, this doesn't matter. I don't, you know, but you're polite. You'll tell me, uh, that's very neat, Paul. You've got cool features, right? But in your mind, you're thinking, God, I got another mouth to feed, you know, come on. I, like, you know, and so everything we talk about, even if you were to like, if, so, <laughs> I hope your audience tries this. On our website, there's an 800 number. Call the 800 number and just, just cold call it randomly for like block your phone number. I don't care. Just call the 800 number. And when somebody picks up here, and there's only like 30 of us, so you're going to know who it is anyway. Call them and you say, hey, listen, uh, I'm a PT. Listen, I don't have time. I, I just, oh, I only remember your phone number. I'm sitting on this street corner in Wisconsin. Can you just quickly Google the closest pizza place for me? They're going to do it. Because we've built this whole culture of like, just give. Just give. Like, you know, like, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not a pizza company, but somebody called us for help. Let's just help them. Yeah. That's awesome. And then that's the that's the makings of something remarkable. Yeah. You know. No, so, that's great. I, that's what I love about your content strategy too. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but when I like was getting to know your your brand and your you know what you guys were doing, it's like whether you know this or not, your 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 own style but your team style is very similar in the sense that like you guys just sort of give the content away um and, and the way you deliver that content is genuine. Like I, you know, it, my rational brain knows that you're, you guys are capitalists and you got to get paid. I, my rational brain knows that. Right. But most humans make decisions on emotions anyway. And it's like, Hey, this person seems like genuine, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and that goes a long way. So anyway, um, I know we've kind of gotten off the topic of RCM, but uh, you know, I, I just, I'll just, Stop by saying, stop that part by just saying that, like, I just want people to get paid. And, like, what, what we've accepted as normal in this industry is not okay. And 
you know, before anybody says, well, let's change the system. Well, that's above our pay grades. Come on. Yeah. Like that, that, that's like government stuff. You got to figure all that out do that if that's what you believe. But the rest of us, we got to get paid tomorrow, the day after the day after, and let's just be practical about it. So you want to do billing in house? Well, let's figure out what your process is going to be. You know, you use that example of like, Hey, the denial came back and now you, it, it's got a code and what is an eight five? Well, if you want to have your billing in house without any technology or whatever, let's, that's fine. Let's start to be serious about what your your um, process is for for figuring those things out, keeping your people trained, and all that stuff, right? Like let, let's let's be practical about it. On the other hand, you want to use an outsourced billing company. You ask them the question, like, what do they believe that uh, everybody else disagrees, and decide for yourself whether or not you think that's enough to get you uh, what you deserve. So ultimately, um, you know. We have this stat that's on the website there that says, you know, 99.999. It actually goes six digits past the decimal point. <clears throat> if, if, if your practice is not getting paid at least 99.999% of what you are owed from your payers, your shit's broken. And, and it doesn't, you don't even have to use us, but just understand that's the benchmark. That's yeah. the benchmark. Um, so let me, let me, let me just pause no. there. <laughs> no, in fact, I think that's like a wonderful place to end it. That's awesome. Like ending on the, the soapbox. Um, <laughs> and I got to go pick up my kids from school soon. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> this good. has been awesome. If people do want to learn more about you, about Strata, about what you do, where, where do you want to send them? Just stratapt.com? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. If you want to learn more about the business, go to stratapt.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is Paul Singh is basically like the equivalent of Steve Smith in India. Yeah, I was about so to say. There, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of us, but um, yeah, just if you type in Paul Singh Strata, you, you should be able to find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, and my email is just paul at stratapt.com. And um, I, I admit I get way too much email, but if you just, just Put Rafi's name in the in the headline to, to say something funny about Rafi in the in yeah. the subject, and I'll, I'll pick it up. <laughs> awesome. So cool deal. Yeah, man, I'm happy to help though. This is this is great. Thanks, man. Well, have a good one. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Paul Singh. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of talking with folks who are trying to do something different in the healthcare industry who are not from the healthcare industry. Actually, I just got off the phone with a, or a, the phone, does anybody use a phone anymore? Off of Zoom, a Zoom call with a, uh, a former client of mine and they're actually gonna be on the show, I think. And we were talking around this idea of oftentimes the solutions to problems in from within an industry or in an industry do not come from within that same industry. Uh, most of the disruptors, most of the, the actual big changes that happen to solve some of those problems, the solutions to those problems, come from outside of the industry, um, either from uh, entrepreneurial or innovative individuals who see how a, how a solution fixed a similar problem in industry A and bring it to industry B, or somebody that, like Paul, by happenstance ended up in industry B with a past experience in industry A and said, you know what, why don't we just take what worked here and bring it over here? Um, so, I, again, I, I just think it's really interesting to see his perspective about the way that he approaches the problems coming from the tech world. I think one of the big takeaways and this bears mentioning again and again and again and again, because I have these conversations with practice owners, with people within the healthcare industry, that part of the, the limitations that we see within the business of healthcare, the actual getting paid for the services, some of those nuances, the, the challenges, if you would, are not, um, a lot of times they're not regulatory problems. I think it's very easy to say, oh, the government is screwing up healthcare because the government has this regulation in place and that in place. I will be the first to tell you that I'm not a fan of government sticking its nose in anywhere. You know, we had uh, Ed Kless and Ron Baker from, oh, what's their podcast? Um, 
Oh, it's it's escaping me. We we had a conversation around innovation in healthcare and why healthcare innovation is so slow to come to market. Um, and one of their big reasons was, well, regulatory burden. It takes so many billions of dollars and, and trials and years and time in order to bring some of these uh, innovations to market. And that is true. I get that. That is something we can work on. However, as Paul mentioned, like some of the ways and the nuances around money and the way money is exchanged and payments are handled in healthcare is not so much a regulatory problem as, as it is a business limitation. It's not even a technology limitation. The technology exists. It's a business limitation. We have come in healthcare to be okay with the fact that I don't get paid for 45, 60 days after doing a service. What other industry is that the norm or acceptable? Or what industry is it the norm or acceptable for a, a customer to say, you know what, I don't feel like I should pay you. I got this bill, I don't feel like it's right, so I'm not gonna pay you. I was just having a conversation the other day with a, uh, a patient in the clinic. So I'm, I'm not treating all that much in the clinic, maybe a few hours a week here and there, but my, my big office is upstairs on top of the clinic, and I get called in for some of these, these conversations every now and then. And I came down, was talking to the patient, and I just said very, very frankly to this patient because they were talking about how they weren't going to pay this bill, that they thought their insurance was going to cover it. The insurance did not cover it and put it on the patient's responsibility, but they weren't going to pay it anyways. And I said, well, at what point does it become okay for you to steal from, I use the Starbucks example because we have a Starbucks across the street from the clinic. I said, at what point does it become okay for you to steal a cup of coffee from Starbucks? Well, never. You, so you can't just walk in there, get yourself some fancy schmancy coffee with whipped cream and the whole nine yards and walk out and say, well, you know what? I, I'm not going to pay for this. And the patient said, well, I would never do that. I said, okay, that's exactly what you've done here, or at least what you're telling me you're going to do here. We've done a service. We've provided it for you. We've even run it through your, your insurance company who has paid the majority of the cost for you. And now you're not going to pay your share. That is stealing. And I think we need to have more conversations like that in healthcare where we need to be not belligerent, but firm about the fact that it is not okay to steal from your providers. It is not okay to not pay them for the services that they've already done. In a lot of cases have done and paid staff members to do. You know, those expenses have, are, are already out the door and deducted from the accounts. Um, and that's something that it, for some reason in healthcare is totally fine. We just don't have a qualm about it at all. Oh, this is just the way business works. We do we do the service, we we pay, we bear the cost up front and hopefully we get paid on the back end. That is never one it's never a good business model, but it's not acceptable in other industries. So, you know, it should not be acceptable in healthcare. Anyways, um I love I loved uh having Paul on the show. Maybe we'll have him on the show again. If you're interested, shoot me an email info at rehabupracticesolutions.com or just leave us a, a comment on the contact form at betteroutcomes.show. I'm thinking about having him on the show again just to talk about business in general, the way what, what he thinks about when investing in a business, what does he look for specifically maybe in healthcare or healthcare technology if he was going to invest in a business in that area, area or industry. Um, and just kind of pick his pick his brain a little bit on that for for y'all's benefit because I think you have somebody you know that's investing in 200 new businesses a year like they've got some experience in the way they they approach uh, how they evaluate investments you know the nerdy part of me is like oh I'm all about that so anyways if you like the show you can always head on over to iTunes leave us a rating and review it helps people find us that's wonderful um, if you run a healthcare business and you really want to learn how to or develop um, a strategy that is in line with those three rules that Paul that Paul mentioned, um, head on over to positioning.rehabupracticesolutions.com or strategy.rehabupracticesolutions.com or just go to our website, rehabupracticesolutions.com. Get in contact with me. I'd love to sit down with you and have a conversation about how um, I can help you do that, how I can help you craft a, a marketing and new business development strategy that's going to really be effective in targeting the people that you want to target. So um, that is it. That's all I've got. Of course, you can go to the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, and you can find that at book.betteroutcomes.show. 
Until the next time, folks. Oh, I'm going to be out for a couple weeks, so there will be a delay in episodes, I believe, unless I can get some stuff worked on the back end in the next 24 hours. Um, we're having a baby. Um, I mentioned it uh, when I was talking to Paul. Um, we're having a baby. I will not respond to emails or social media messages or anything like that because I'm going to be off grid. But if you shoot an email to info at rehabupracticesolutions.com, our team can get that wrapped up, get you a response, connect you, maybe put you on the schedule if you need to be put on the schedule or whatever it is. Um, and then I will be back in full swing in a couple weeks, albeit I'm sure a little bit more sleep deprived. So until the next time, folks, be safe, be healthy. I will talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients, helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.